the, of this process. Um, so there aren't going to be, we, we originally hoped that by this time we would have uh, estimates of poverty impacts to, to present. We don't have that. Uh, but we do have a taste, uh, a somewhat simplistic taste of some of, uh, some of the results coming out with regard to sources of yield gains. Uh, so the latter part of my presentation, if you hold tight till the end, uh, you will get to see some preliminary findings about what the big winners in, in terms of yield gains will be. They're not, we, we haven't uh, had time to process the input-output data in order to look at technologies that improve efficiency, that are cost savings, uh, that have other more, more uh, complicated effects. Um, but, but there are some, some interesting results at the end of this presentation. To begin with, though, I'll start with the, the process and how we will use these data and how we will get to uh, estimating impacts uh, for the poor uh, and on the environment. So just to review where we are, from, for those who haven't, uh, may have just stepped in or if they weren't here before the coffee break, uh, where we are right now is we have about uh, 55 uh, research solutions uh, that have been assessed by participatory scientists working groups uh, where they've looked at uh, the resource requirements, probabilities of success in terms of having uh, research solutions developed, the time frames for those being developed, and then the expected adoption levels and on-farm input-output effects. They've done this, uh, these 55 solutions are still not all the solutions. Some of them are still being discussed. Uh, there are interesting points where we do have particular uncertainty or divergent views where we're still discussing. Uh, we also have probably on the order of something like another 20 uh, that we still haven't yet done, uh, that are ones that are particularly more uh, complicated or maybe even areas where we do not have sufficient in-house capacity to make a good assessment and we need more to bring in external expertise. Uh, those assessments of the research solutions have been backed up by analyses of problem prevalence and trends in those problems. And that's been complemented by what was presented in the first presentation, and that's a spatial analysis of uh, trends in actual yield and uh, attainable yield to 2035 so that we identify how uh, the base yields uh, that we, we should assume for when different technologies come in, what the base yields will be, and so we can look at what that scope for all technologies that help to close the yield gap is collectively over time, how that is evolved. We will use that uh, to basically triangulate the, the information we get from the scientists. We don't want to be uh, coming up with estimates that say that we are actually exceeding uh, the yield gap through technologies that close the yield gap. So it's a, it's a good reality check on what we're doing. So we'll take uh, those, those estimates, which uh, Boss gave you a much more detailed uh, picture of. Uh, those are generally in relative terms, in terms of uh, effects on input use, uh, different elements of production costs. Um, so we, we have an extensive in-house survey database uh, covering many different Asian countries that we're going to use to get the, the baseline values in terms of input output use by operation so that then we can translate those relative changes into absolute changes and we can look at what the unit cost of production is and how that's being shifted by the particular technologies. When we do that, we also will take into account uh, the adoption trajectory over time and the adoption trajectory over time that would be likely for the solution without Erie. So that will all be reflected in uh, the effect that's estimated on the unit cost of production. Now, why is the unit cost of production important? Uh, it's important because, A, it's the basis of farm revenue changes, and B, there's an important dynamic effect that when the unit cost of production, the production goes down, the uh, general market price will go down, and you need to incorporate that in order to see what the farm level benefits are. So the price effects of uh, the changes in the unit cost of production are, are being modeled via our own global rice trade model that's uh, been developed by Sam Mahanti. I, I won't go into uh, the specifics of the model, but uh, I'll just illustrate a few aspects quickly. Uh, the, the model itself uh, then has uh, elements of the, the cost of production uh, that are used in terms of determining uh, the supply for a given country, 
And basically the changes in the unit cost of production will be shocked into this element of the national rice supply. That national rice supply will then uh, be shocked into the equilibrium of uh, supply and demand and trade for an individual country, which then will be equilibrated across the different countries in the model. And so the model includes these 18 countries, and most of the countries are subnationally disaggregated. So we actually get subnational price effects uh, as a result in, of the change in the unit cost of production from adoption of the technologies. So once we have uh, the, the change in, in the unit cost of production, and uh, we have the data on the price effect, uh, we can then look at which what portion of production is occurring by those under the poverty line and what their general characteristics are compared with average producers, particularly in the area of rice that they have cultivated, because that will determine what kinds of farm-level benefits uh, they can receive uh, from the technologies, uh, considering the equilibrium price response. Um, so we have uh, uh, data sets on the spatial distribution of poverty. Uh, we can use that to approximate uh, the number of, of poor in the different aggregate ecologies, and uh, based on that, we can we can look at the proportion of benefits accruing to those poor households when we take into account their differences, particularly in production area. Then, on the uh, consumer side, it's also very important to look at benefits to the poor. Uh, through the trade model, we get these price effects, and we know that poor consumers spend very high proportions of their income on rice in Asia. Uh, they spend about 50% of their food income on rice, and it's about 25% of their entire household income for, uh, for the population surviving on less than $1.25 per day in purchasing power of parity terms. So, so that's also an extremely important uh, pathway to impact for the poor. So, so this was a, a simple run that we did before uh, looking at an aggregate contribution uh, to productivity and rice supply. It's a very modest uh, set of assumptions we used. We basically said that we will continue productivity contributions at the same level as we've been documented to do historically up until 19, from 19, uh, I believe it was 1960 to 1998, that we would continue the same level of contribution. With that same level of contribution, uh, you, you end up with these kinds of, of benefits. It, it was basically a, a net contribution of, of 15 kilograms of rice on average per hectare per year for, for Asia. With that kind of a, a contribution, it's about 8.5% over 25 years. You end up with a, a price reduction that ranges from 9 to 18%. The price reduction exceeds the supply increase. So that price reduction then, considering how much the poor actually spend on rice, it has massive benefits for poor consumers. So if you look here, that kind of a price reduction over 25 years would lift 125 million people above the $1.25 a day poverty line, if you count the reduction in their expenditure on rice as income. If you look at the proportion of the population that's food insecure, if that expenditure savings were used to purchase rice to close the caloric gap, potentially another 62 million people could be lifted out of hunger. That's a big assumption, but it's, it's a possibility. So taking into account the consumer side is very important. Also, when you see that these price effects are so pronounced, it's important that we consider that when we come back to the producer benefits. So economic and poverty benefits are, are not the, the only benefits we're looking at. Uh, we also will uh, look at environmental benefits. In particular, when you have such a big price response, you get an area response. So through the productivity enhancing technologies, you actually have less area under rice. And part of that decline in rice area is also an avoidance of expansion. So given that there's a lot of land pressure in Asia and competing land uses, some uh, alleviation of that pressure on land will save 
uh, natural land cover, such as tropical forests. So taking into account the, the environmental benefits of, of that savings of natural ecosystems is, is very important and something that we're trying to reflect here. The spatial disaggregation of the model in terms of the supply response can help because then we can look at where uh, the contraction in area happens relative to the proportion of, say, forest cover. We will also then look at the more direct uh, environmental benefits, such as Boss mentioned for AWD, uh, in terms of the reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we will supplement this with uh, analysis of the health benefits uh, from our biofortification work uh, and potentially some work to uh, uh, reduce the glycemic index of rice. And then we will put together all these different uh, data on expected impact by different impact sources and we'll compare it with our patterns of resource allocation uh, to look at where are, are areas that are in need of additional investment in order to uh, realize much greater impact. So those are the methodological steps going forward. Um, I didn't want to go into a great uh, level of detail because uh, we are, this is the last presentation of the day and I want to leave some time for discussion. I'll now present some very preliminary results based on sources of yield gains using the parameter estimates of the sort that Bass was, was presenting. Now I have to, of course, give a number of caveats because these are very preliminary. Uh, these are not final estimates. We are still in the process of, of refining and reviewing uh, our assumptions in, the, in these sheets. We are, though, looking at this as an opportunity for feedback. So we do want your feedback. Your feedback still can affect actually what we're estimating, given that we are still in that process of adjustments. This, what I will present, is only on the sources of yield gains. So it's a subset of all the research solutions. It only includes those that we have more confidence in, uh, our estimates. And it, it doesn't include a whole array of technologies, such as uh, those that increase efficiency, uh, those that are quality-oriented, post-harvest technologies, policy-oriented research, etc. Those are incorporated in our priority-setting exercise, but they will not be incorporated in what's presented right now. This does not take into account the actual effect on the unit cost of production. It's solely based on yield, and it's only using the lower bound uh, parameters from scientists on adoption. Uh, 